Hi, my name is Daniel Kwan. Hi, Dan. Uh, I'm Daniel Scheinert. And, and you're watching Consequence. Consequence. And it's got an animated oh, yeah, animated up in 3D. Well, congratulations. You guys are our 2022 Filmmakers of the Year. And I'm truly so excited to talk to you. I love everything everywhere all at once so very much. And so I'm so glad that you guys decided to sit down with us. Of course, thank you so much. What a it's crazy. There's it's this has been a very good year for movies. So the fact that we yeah. are um, even considered one of the better better filmmakers this year is um, is it's dumb. It's stupid. This is yeah, yeah. No. You, picked, you picked the wrong uh, people. It should have been Charlotte Wells, uh, Ruben Ostland, uh, Nathan Fielder, and no, it's, uh, this was really fun. But it sounds like I have to go. Um, yeah. But, <laughs> well, I, I again, am so happy to talk to you because I loved the film. I saw it two or three times in theaters, and I feel like the first thing I was curious about. There are so many memorable images that have come out of this movie, like the rock sequence and hot dog hands. And I'm just curious if there were any uh, moments when you guys were putting this all together that you felt like, okay, people are really gonna love this, people are gonna latch onto this, or just how it feels seeing those screenshots and moments be passed around and kind of become viral moments here in 2020. Yeah, that's a great question. We we do often start from images. That's like where we come from music videos. So images have always been um, the starting point. And uh, I think the first image that got me really excited about this whole thing was just the image of a character screaming as they flash every frame, a different image, a different universe. Um, and I, I was like, oh, I, I haven't seen that before. It's such a simple trick. And if we can build the scaffolding up to make that a like, very like emotional moment, it could mm -hmm. be really beautiful and interesting. So that the was- The funny something. thing is like, that was an image that was one of the very, very last ones that we pulled off. That we finished. You yeah, know, yeah. like we were, we had locked the edit, we had done most of the visual effects. And then one of the very last things we did was was go in and frame by frame, drop in the various Evelyns in different places. Right, yeah. And I remember the first time we watched it on the big screen, oh, yeah. we were all just like, whoa oh it worked yeah actually it, our, it took our, like four or five years our, our vfx team like cheered i remember they were yeah like, it was it was it. during our vfx reviews review yeah. watch down of the whole movie and they had never seen it in its entirety and right uh but it, that was it, very exciting it's kind of it kind of it's our version of um of uh, the vertigo shot you know or the the shot from 2001 where it's just a person going through an existential moment and just seeing their their face and mm -hmm. I, I i was very excited to find the 2022 version of that so that's one image that really i love and then the were, rock, the rocks i think was one where i was like i don't care if no one else likes this i love it i'm so happy that we snuck it into this movie yeah and, and, and the fact that it's resonating is just has been um such a great surprise it's it's really but also it says a lot about us as a culture that uh we are so such broken people we are so traumatized by the past 10 years that like shot of two rocks could could resonate so much because what it represents is a moment of quiet and i, I think a lot mm -hmm. of people um have not been able to find that moment um it, it, it's this yeah things are really hard right now and so the fact that it resonates is, is it's a little sad but also really beautiful that we were able to help right but they also like image. it because that other image that you chased was so obnoxious and unpleasant yes and it's right before yeah yeah that's right that's right <laughs> You're like, oh, please stop. I'm like, oh, thank God, rocks. Yeah. Um, <laughs> well, kind of on a similar note, were there any moments that you really thought to keep in the film or that you wanted to make sure made that final cut? Um, we were very lucky that like everybody that worked on it believed in it. Um, but so there weren't like big battles of keeping things. I mean, the biggest battle was that there was a universe that that everyone loved in the script. Everyone loved shooting it. And it just didn't work in the edit. Mm -hmm. And so we fought to try to make it work. And it's called Spaghetti Baby Noodle Boy. And it's a universe where Michelle is talking spaghetti and she has a little baby that's a talking macaroni. And uh, and it just didn't work in the edit. We fought so hard and eventually we had to accept that that we were going to lose that fight, you know, yeah. and that it was going to be release the spaghetti baby noodle cut. It's <laughs> it's on the Blu-ray, uh, like but we pieces. never finished the VFX. And by design, it was like going to be intercut throughout the movie. So it's it's kind of hard. It's kind of you know, chaotic. Yeah. To sure. do a short film. 
So I'm also curious, it's so interesting that you say that you have these images and then you kind of worked backwards from there. Um, tell me a little bit more. I feel like at the core of the story, to me at least, I walked out feeling like it was a story about a mother and a daughter. So tell me how you got to that emotional core mm -hmm. in the process. Yeah, I, th I think we like, we, a lot of our movies are kind of like a project, like a puzzle project that like is going to be a therapeutic exploration that's going to take years, you know, because we know a feature is going to take forever. Um, so like this one started as like we were chasing uh, the too muchness of being alive right now and of the Internet. And, and that's all we knew it was like that, like uh, Kung Fu fight scenes are cool. Uh, and if we could go to across multiverses, we, it would be a cinematic challenge. And it, and it was while chasing this structural journey of like, go to too many places and then bring it back, try to pull the audience away from nihilism that it, we kind of came around to the generation gap. It came around to like uh, someone our age trying to connect with someone our parents' age. And the more we put ourselves into it, the more specific and interesting the family got and and how scary the personal stuff got and but it, it was very much constantly in flux trying to yeah we we're just trying to discover what was going to help make the that the that structure work so right. you know at one point it was a father-daughter relationship then it became a mother-daughter relationship for a second we thought oh what if it's a a, a mother-son relationship it was always just chasing after um something that felt truthful mm -hmm. and then the final thing that that really decided it was that we found the right actors so we found michelle we found stephanie Shu, and we were like okay now that we know that we have these incredible people who are going to embody these characters let's let's rewrite again and we mm -hmm. rewrite again with them in mind and I, I think that's a big part of our process is, is rewriting based on what we have available to us and we just happen to find these incredible actresses and we're like this is it's this is it this is going to be a very personal mother-daughter relationship but yeah the character stuff is is some of the last stuff that gets ironed out believe it or not um so interesting. yeah Cool. Yeah. And I'm so glad you mentioned the actors because I wanted to ask about, um, you know, obviously incredible performance from Michelle Yeoh, Stephanie Chu, and then this deservedly lauded performance from Ki Wei Kwan. And I'm just so excited that everyone is reacting as they should be. And so talk to me a little bit about being on set with these wonderful people. And if there were any standout moments that you really remember, which is probably a very difficult question with such incredible actors. Mm -hmm. No, it's an easy one. Yeah, there's so many, but there, there's one we like to talk about, which is that we did a table read of the screenplay uh, like a few, couple days before shooting. Um, so like it was like the week before photography started. We finally had like Michelle in town. Everyone was there, uh, except we didn't have Jamie yet in the room. But uh, but still, we we had the the whole family there. And as they read the script and they actually did it in Chinese, like they would kind of like the whole family came to life and they started teasing each other and laughing at the jokes and, and all this stuff that kind of like, we weren't sure if it worked or not on the page just really came to life, you know, like yeah. Michelle and James, it really felt like she was like frustrated by her father and like he was teasing her. And uh, it was as a filmmaker, you know, just a huge load just got lifted off our shoulders as we just watched them take the characters and make it and bring them to life you know and it was like oh wow the next eight weeks are going to be fun knowing you know now that i've seen where it's going and that it's gonna work and and people get, laughed and people got emotional and it was a it was a really special afternoon uh even though i don't speak chinese and i didn't know what they were laughing at sometimes <laughs> <laughs> that's wonderful yeah. yeah i mean that was that, that was probably the best moment that, that was like the the moment where everything clicked but then every every one of our actors gave us something special on uh, on a, in a very specific scene in different ways and so yeah it was it was it was a really beautiful um shoot because you know some days we'd all be laughing until we cried and other days we'd be just crying because we were crying and it was really great that um our team was able to put together a an atmosphere in which that was totally fine um and yeah I, the 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 um what we told our first ad was like prioritize the fight scenes give us a lot of time for the fight scenes and give us a lot of time for the cry scenes you know the, the emotional sequences mm -hmm. and um it was really fun to kind of um 
even though the movie was crazy and the schedule was was um, impossible to really slow down for the those sequences like the parking lot or like when Wayman has to give his little plea for kindness like those were really um, important to us and we slowed down and it was really lovely they did such a good job Absolutely. Yeah. So I want to pivot real quick because I would love to talk about the costuming in this film and what it was like to communicate your vision to Shirley Karata and then seeing it brought to life because I think that there are just so many incredible moments uh, with the costuming that elevated it to another level. Um, So talk to me a little bit about that. Yeah. I mean, uh, our producer, Jonathan Wong, introduced us to Shirley and her work uh, a, a while before we shot uh and 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 once she once we met her and and she said that she was excited to do it it was like this again a huge weight came off our shoulders because we were like oh my god her work's incredible we basically just have to tell her to do her thing um because she mean, half the job of a director is just hiring the right people and finding the right people and and Shirley was the perfect person yeah because cool. she like uh she styles a bunch of kind of avant-garde indie pop musicians and indie like pop musicians, uh, yeah. like Tierra Wack does like really bold, weird costumes. And, and, and we were like, this is the perfect marriage. And then we met with her and she talked about how much she loves digging through Chinatown, like stalls looking for bizarre, you know, uh, knockoff brand clothing or purses or, or whatever. And, the, and so she was like just as excited to do the grounded family costumes as she was to do you know the jobu work and and so the relationship became us telling her and hair and makeup anisa and michelle like the broad strokes of what we needed and then them coming back and just blowing our minds and and us high-fiving them you know uh i think in the end we when you're directing you half the cost is just getting the specific thing you want you know like if you want a specific thing it's going to cost you money you're fighting inertia you're fighting entropy to like basically play god um and the opposite way of filmmaking can be actually really freeing where you instead you collaborate with the universe and so we just say this is the intention these are the ideas here's a mood board of images Mm -hmm. but tell us what the universe is giving to you for cheaper and free and then we will rewrite and we will find whatever so a lot of it was them it's like a scavenger hunt they went out find found different outfits and we'd be like okay this outfit let's let's slot it in here let's rewrite this thing okay this outfit is great but let's combine it with this outfit and now let's place it here and so there were certain things that we were like this has to be this way and we we're going to put some money towards it and that's going to be important and then there are a lot of other things where we're like surprise us show us what you have and we will rewrite to what you find us so it was really it's the only way you could pull off something as as ambitious as this for as little money and time that we had mm-hmm. so that was that was our process and surely and surely michelle and Lisa, they did a great job together yeah right. Great. Yeah. So I do feel, as I've said, as I'm sure you can tell, I love the movie. I do think it's going to inspire a lot of people who are hoping to become filmmakers someday. And so I would love to know what stories inspired you guys um, growing up and really shaped your own creative identities. Mm. Wow. A lot of times it's like, I got really into jackass in middle school, like a lot of middle school boys. Uh, <laughs> and um, And then you know, discovered uh, the 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 DVDs that had all the music videos that Spike Jones and Michelle Gondry and Chris Cunningham right. made. Director's label or the director, director's notes? Yeah, I think yeah. director's label DVDs. Yeah, and yeah. uh, and then Spike turns out co-created Jackass, and 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 like his work in particular, like was like uh, you wanted to be there. You could tell it was fun to make, even his heavier work, you know, like adaptation or being John Malkovich, like there's this sort of like skateboarder fun, you can kind of sense, you know, inside of it all. Um, and and it, all of that kind of like something clicked in me where I was like, I want to chase after that. Like that's um, what, yeah, made me start wanting to make more movies with my friends. Um, that and my brother, uh, my older brother would make movies with his friends and I was just so jealous. <laughs> I was like, I want, I want to do it. Can I come? And he'd be like, no. Um, it's like he and his friends made a Kung Fu movie in high school and I was jealous. And uh, look at me now. <laughs> I, I think I think the single, one of the most important pieces of advice we ever got as a, as a directing duo was uh, at the Sundance Labs, the Sundance Institute, the Writers Lab, or actually the Directors Lab. Um, they had this incredible mentor and uh, acting coach and acting um, teacher 
uh, named Joan Darling, and she is just a incredible creative human being, very spiritual and and smart about how um, she moves the world. I, I just real I just read her Wikipedia page recently and found out she's I think she's the first female director to ever win an Emmy for directing um, a TV show or whatever. She's in, yeah. Mm -hmm. And what's the word so, uh, semantic predestination? Uh, oh, no, nominal nominal predestination is yeah. when your name yeah. you know uh d determines your destiny because so like if you if you name a kid uh cutie pie they they might turn out pretty cute uh so it, it worked out joan darling is darling she is yeah. a darling. it's my long-winded yeah. joke <laughs> but the thing is she 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 said something very early on it's like as a director your job is to be a party host you're there to set the vibe and make sure everyone is comfortable because if you bring everyone into a party and everyone is comfortable, you are going to create the best party possible. Everyone who needs to be talking to each other, you bring them together. Everyone needs, so basically you, you, you give, you give everyone what they need because um, everyone has different needs and different roles in a party. Um, and I thought that was really lovely because I think most metaphors until then that we had heard was, you know, closer to the military. Um, that's usually what you think of when you think of a, of a film set. Um, it was modeled after the military. And uh, since then, I've just been looking for other ways that people have to do things. You know, Jill Soloway, they they talk about how um, therapy and these communal um, moments before every day they shoot, they do, they, they, they talk about their feelings and how they're feeling that day. Um, and they're very connected in that way. Um, us personally, we're, we're like summer camp counselors. That's how we look at the film shoot. And I think for, you know, future filmmakers who are looking to, uh, figure out their process, like experiment with process, think about who you are and what your strengths are and try to figure out what your process is. You don't have to imitate people. You don't have to imitate us. Um, and I think it took us a long time to, it took, it took me a long time to realize that because I think so many of the directors I looked up to, uh, just directed it in the way that I could not see myself in. So, yeah. That's great. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. I always love hearing what inspires other creatives and other writers. I just, it's so interesting to me. Um, so to wrap up a quick, sharp turn, um, what are both of your bagel orders? Oh, this is, I know a real hardball. <laughs> I, I love this. He's a big bagel guy. So yeah, me too. Yeah. So I was very excited about the everything bagel being such a pivotal, pivotal. <laughs> I, I vary it up a lot, but the uh, Bell's Bagels uh, sells bagels in Highland Park, Los Angeles, and uh, they're very chewy, salty, seated on both sides bagels. And uh, I bounce around, but like they they have beet schmear. So it's like, like beets are whipped up in the cream cheese and they also have salmon skin as one of the toppings. Oh, yeah. And so like, there's one that's like salmon skin and beet schmear that I love. Uh, so it's like crunchy. It's like fried salmon skin. So it's like crunchy seafoody loxy, but yeah, yeah that one's good. That one's bonkers. Um, but then they also have like a vegan bagel. That's fantastic. That has like hot sauce and avocado and sprouts and they have a radish, cabbage, which is really bomb. Um, uh, the nostalgic part of me wants to say that uh, my bagel of choice is a cheddar jalapeno bagel with cheddar jalapeno cream cheese. Because when we first started directing together, we would shoot a lot in New York. And every time we came to New York, we'd get iced coffee and a cheddar cheddar jalapeno bagel, which is like now I think about it, it's kind of gross. But like that was very much like. Our, no, my, it's a classic. Yeah, I know. it's really. Yeah, it's really good. But um, yeah, that that because we're in New York right now, that's what I'm thinking about. Yeah. 